Section 1. You will hear a customer phoning a builder to discuss some work she would like him to do on her home. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Thorndykes? Good morning. Is that Mr Thorndyke? Speaking. How can I help? I've got quite a few things which need painting and fixing in the flat, and I wonder whether you'd be able to do the work. I'm sure I'd be able to help, but let me take down a few details. Yes, of course. Well, uh, firstly, how did you hear about us? It was my friend May Hampton. You did some excellent work for her a couple of years ago. Do you remember? Oh, yes. That was in West Park Flats. Lovely lady. Yes, she is. And what's your name, please? It's Edith Pargeter. Edith, can you spell your surname, please? It's P-A-R-G-E-T-T-E-R. Double T, right. And do you live in West Park Flats as well? No, actually, it's East Park, Flat 4. Oh, right. That's over the road, I seem to remember. Quite difficult to get to. Yes, it's at the back of the library. Right, I know. And uh, what's your phone number? 875-934. But I'm out a great deal in the afternoons and evenings. So would the best time to ring you be in the morning? Yes. Fine, I've made a note of that. Can I just ask, I'll be in a van, and I know parking's rather difficult around your flat. Where would you recommend? Well, I always tell people in larger vehicles to park by the post box on the other side of the road from the entrance. Good, thanks. And will you be able to give me a full itemised quote? Oh, yes. I'll list all the jobs separately with individual prices. That'd be a great help. No problem. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, what would you like me to do? Firstly, and most urgently, is in the kitchen. With all the weather damage, the glass in the door has cracked and I'd need that fixing. I presume you mean replacing? Oh, yes, and as soon as possible. What I'll do is come round tomorrow morning and do that immediately. Oh, thank you so much. The other things aren't so urgent, but... Now, I'll make a note of everything you want doing. Well, in the kitchen, I'd like some painting doing. All the kitchen walls? Just the area over the cooker. It's very greasy. Right. It does tend to get that way. Yes. Well, if you want a proper job done, what I'd need to do is strip the old paint and plaster it about a week before I paint it. Of course. Now, May tells me you also do work in the garden. That's right. Well, I'd like you to replace a fence. Just one? Yes, at the far end. Fine. Shouldn't be a problem. And that's the lot. Fine. Yeah, as I say, I can come round tomorrow morning to look over things with you. Well, that's great. Thank you. So, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at... That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a man talking on the radio about dogs which help people with their work. First, look at questions 11 and 12.
As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 and 12. Welcome to this week's edition of Countrywide. And today, we're taking a look at a number of different breeds of working dogs. And here to report on the dogs with jobs is Kevin Thornhill. Thanks, Joanne. Well, yes, dogs with jobs is the subject of today's program. Dogs have earned themselves a reputation over the centuries for being extremely loyal. And here's a little story which illustrates just how loyal they are. Just outside the country town of Gundagai in Australia is a statue built to commemorate a dog. A dog which sat waiting for his owner to return to the spot where he'd left him. Well, the story, which was immortalised in a song, has it that the poor dog died waiting for his master. Five miles from Gundagai, which is where they built the statue. Now that's what I call loyalty. Now look at questions 13 to 20. As the talk continues, complete the table for questions 13 to 20. Well, because of their loyalty and also their ability to learn practical skills, dogs can be trained to do a number of very valuable jobs. Perhaps the most well-known of working dogs is the Border Collie Sheepdog. Sheepdogs which work in unison with their masters need to be smart and obedient, with a natural ability to herd sheep. Some farmers say that their dogs are so smart that they not only herd sheep, they can count them too. Another much-loved working dog is the guide dog, trained to work with the blind. Guide dogs, usually Labradors, need to be confident enough to lead their owner through traffic and crowds, but they must also be of a gentle nature. It costs a great deal of money to train a dog for this very valuable work, but the guide dog associations in the UK, America and Australia receive no government assistance, so all the money comes from donations. Another common breed of work dog is the German Shepherd. German Shepherds make excellent guard dogs and are also very appropriate as search and rescue dogs, working in disaster zones after earthquakes and avalanches. These dogs must be tough and courageous to cope with the arduous conditions of their work, and so that they can be sent anywhere in the world to assist in disaster relief operations, effective dogs and their trainers are now listed on an international database. When you arrive at an airport here, you may be greeted in the baggage hall by a detector dog wearing a little red coat bearing the words quarantine. These dogs are trained to sniff out fresh fruit as well as meat and even live animals hidden in people's bags. In order to be effective, a good detector dog must have an enormous food drive. In other words, they must really love their food. At Sydney Airport, where there are 10 detector dogs working full time, they stop about 80 people a month trying to bring illegal goods into the country. And according to their trainers, they very rarely get it wrong. Another famous working dog is the Husky. Huskies, which originally came from Siberia, have been used for decades as a means of transport on snow, particularly in Antarctica where they have played an important role. Huskies are well adapted to harsh conditions and they enjoy working in a team. But the Huskies have all left Antarctica now because the International Treaty prohibits their use in the Territory as they are not native animals. Many people were sad to see the dogs leave Antarctica as they had been vital to the early expeditions and earned their place in history along with the explorers. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. In this section, you will hear a discussion between a male interviewer and a woman who is the manager of a major bookstore. First, look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen to the 
their conversation and answer questions 21 to 24. The start of a new academic year is a challenge for booksellers. Lee Rogers talks to one major bookstore manager. Jenny Farrow, you're the manager of Dalton Books, and you sell an awful lot of books to students, don't you? Yes, we do. How do you manage to make sure that you're going to have the books students need when all the new courses begin? Basically, we make preparations long before they arrive. Like all other major book retailers, we have a database of information. And using that, we contact course conveners in May and ask them to send us their book lists. How many books are we talking about? For one course? Yes, as an example. An average course requires about 30 books. We ask lecturers to indicate whether a book is what we call essential reading. You know, the students simply have to get it. Or whether it's what they would term recommended reading. Or whether it's just a supplementary text that they tend to refer to as background reading. What about predicted bias? It's not a perfect system, unfortunately. If a lecturer tells us that he expects us to sell 100 copies of a book, we know that we could actually sell anything from 50 to 150. That's why in practice, when it comes to ordering, it's a lot safer to go by the previous year's sales figures, if that's possible, of course, if we've sold the book before. We also build other factors into the equation, including the type of course that the books are for, the student's year group, and a measure of our own judgment. And these criteria make a fairly accurate guide? As accurate as we can be, yes. Look at questions 25 to 30. Listen carefully and answer questions 25 to 30. What about the publishers? Do they take an active role in promoting new books? Certainly. The academic and professional publishing market is worth about £700 million a year, so publishers go to some lengths to make sure their books are known. The standard procedure they use is to mail out catalogues to lecturers or colleges and universities. That's been the main form of promotion for years. Now, of course, they can also post details of new or revised works on websites. Some even go so far as writing individual letters to the appropriate lecturers in order to let them know what's coming up. The lecturers then contact you if they're interested. That's right. The publishers send us, the booksellers, inspection copies. Lecturers can then get a free copy and decide whether it's going to be suitable for their course. And how does it work with the students? What are they looking for and who helps them most? I think lecturers are best placed to understand the students' needs. Often the critical issue is what represents value for money for students. This is more important than price per se. Do students actually buy books before they start the course? Apparently, a large proportion of students wait to see what they need. Students have a firm idea of what constitutes a good book, so they tend to give themselves time to look at all the options before making a choice. They tend to go for books that are clear and easy to use. Often, the texts that their lecturers recommend turn out to be too academic and remain here on our shelves. Well, that was Jenny Farrow. And I guess tomorrow... That is the end of section three. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture to students of architecture about the design of a public building. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We've been discussing the factors the architect has to consider when designing domestic buildings. I'm going to move on now to consider the design of public buildings, and I'll illustrate this by referring to the new Taylor Concert Hall that's recently been completed here in the city. So, as with a domestic building, when designing a public building, an architect needs to consider the function of the building. For example, is it to be used primarily for entertainment or for education or for administration? The second thing the architect needs to think about is the context of the building. This includes its physical location, obviously, but it also includes the social meaning of the building, how it relates to the people it's built for. And finally, for important public buildings, the architect may also be looking for a central symbolic idea on which to base the design, a sort of metaphor for the building and the way in which it is used. Let's look at the new Taylor Concert Hall in relation to these ideas. The location chosen was a site in a run-down district that has been ignored in previous redevelopment plans. It was occupied by a factory that has been empty for some years. The whole area was some distance from the high-rise office blocks of the central business district and shopping centre, but it was only one kilometre from the ring road. The site itself was bordered to the north by a canal, which had once been used by boats bringing in raw materials when the area was used for manufacturing. The architect chosen for the project was Tom Harrison. He found the main design challenge was the location of the site in an area that had no neighbouring buildings of any importance. To reflect the fact that the significance of the building in this quite run-down location was as yet unknown, he decided to create a building centred around the idea of a mystery, something whose meaning still has to be discovered. So, how was this reflected in the design of the building? Well, Harrison decided to create pedestrian access to the building and to make use of the presence of water on the site. As people approach the entrance, they therefore have to cross over a bridge. He wanted to give people a feeling of suspense as they see the building first from a distance and then close up and the initial impression he wanted to create from the shape of the building as a whole was that of a box. The first side that people see, the southern wall, is just a high, flat wall uninterrupted by any windows. <laughs> this might sound off-putting, but it supports Harrison's concept of the building, that the person approaching is intrigued and wonders what will be inside. And this flat wall also has another purpose. At night time, projectors are switched on and it functions as a huge screen onto which images are projected. The auditorium itself seats 1,500 people. The floors supported by 10 massive pads. These are constructed from rubber and so are able to absorb any vibrations from outside and prevent them from affecting the auditorium. The walls are made of several layers of honey-coloured wood, all sourced from local beech trees. In order to improve the acoustic properties of the auditorium and to amplify the sound, they are not straight, they are curved. The acoustics are also adjustable according to the size of orchestra and the type of music being played. In order to achieve this, there are nine movable panels in the ceiling above the orchestra, which are all individually motorised. And the walls also have curtains, which can be opened or closed to change the acoustics. The reaction of the public to the new building has generally been positive. However, the evaluation of some critics has been less enthusiastic. In spite of Harrison's efforts to use local materials, 
They criticize the style of the design as being international rather than local and say it doesn't reflect features of the landscape or society for which it is built. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.